This next poem is, is about uh, the Russian futurist poem, Vlad futurist poet Vladimir Mayakovsky, and uh, the conversations I have with him in my head. Uh, when I was living in Missouri, uh, I lived pretty close to like a Gerb, is anyone from, from Missouri? You know this Gerb supermarket? Does anyone know that? It's like Kroger. Uh, it's like a version of that. Think of the supermarket near you. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we have Where you have like a little discount card, you know? Mm -hmm. Now it's Key Foods that I live near. They're all the same, basically. <laughs> um, but I would go to the supermarket all the time and to cheer myself up, I would imagine going with Mayakovsky. Uh, <laughs> so Mayakovsky is a really fantastic poet. Uh, not many people know about him. Most poets do. He's like, you know, one of the, probably the greatest maker of metaphor ever uh, in any language, even in English translation. And I'm always told it's terrible, the translation of the Russian, which I can imagine. But it still seems pretty great because metaphor is one of those things that really translate through language pretty well if the metaphor is good enough. Uh, so, you know, kind of being depressed in Missouri, thinking about Mayakovsky getting in my room and kicking my ass was a good way to get out of bed and start to write. Um, and he has this one poem I really like called The Cloud in Trousers, in English translation, which will explain the form in which he appears to me in this poem. It's called Shopping with Mayakovsky. And it steals a lot of the lines from his poems. When he's talking, he's basically using one of the lines from one of his poems. Not all the time, but about half the time. Shopping with Mayakovsky. One morning I wake not wanting to get out of bed and see a cloud in my room. Mayakovsky, I say. Find me some trousers, he orders. I scramble to the closet and pull out a pair of jeans. Don't know if these will fit, I say. Of course they will, he says. I'm a cloud. He puts them on and begins to look more like himself, his cloudiness assembling into a column. Don't have much style, do you, he says. Never mind. Let us go out into the world and find ourselves an ocean. Before I can object, he's kicked me out the door into the sunlight. Ah, just what I was looking for, he says, reaching up for the sun and fixing it like a monocle in his eye. Now, poet, he laughs, slapping me on the back and sending me flying into some pines. Take me to your supermarket. I point him down the street. Rain leaks from his legs, flame leaps from his eye, and as we walk, he floods and scorches, scorches and floods. Marvelous, he cries, your window-flashing automobiles, your torrent of engines. But these buildings are ugly. I slow him down by telling him about my problems in love. What will it be, he says, his face softening, the flood tide letting up. Love or no love? And what kind of love, big or minute? He grins and nudges me with a feathery elbow. Girls are partial to poets. We arrive at the supermarket, where Mayakovsky falls in love with the automatic doors. He walks into the store over and over again, each time announcing, but I... The people in the cash register lines drop their products. Turning, Mayakovsky bows and says, Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Vladimir Mayakovsky, a tragedy. <laughs> One woman screams. The rest smile and bat their eyelashes. I grab a shopping cart and Mayakovsky hops in. We cruise through the aisles, blackening the boxes. Look at all this food, he says. Over there, the ocean. We roll into the frozen fish section, slowing by freezer doors so Mayakovsky can open and fog them one by one. He sees the lobster tank and tells me to stop, going silent with concentration. This is how I feel, I say, stooping. Calmly, Mayakovsky tells me to move on, then, once out of view of the lobsters, wheels and says, stop moping. But what's the point, I say, I'm not you, I'm just wasting my time. You think you're wasting your time? You don't know what it is to waste time until you've written a 3,000-line elegy on the death of Lenin. Try drawing posters and championing boiled water for a change. I apologize, and he says, Who can blame you for feeling unproductive with all these stores around? Forget about them. Sharpen yourself on the edge of your own decision. But what if nobody listens, I ask. Hit them with hammer strokes of metaphor and stanzas like pistol points. Make sure you sing. 
We pass the kitchen utensils, and Mayakovsky plucks a long wooden spoon from its rack, folds a tuft of cloud front neatly back into a lapel, and inserts the spoon like a boutonniere. Now, let us find some women, he says, pointing to the produce section. But then, never under any circumstances set your heel on the throat of your own song. As we turn toward the tomatoes, the spoon shifts, revealing the tiny, clean bullet hole underneath.